Well, it's that time of year where there's no more Sundays before our Saturday service. So we combine all of our members, which is three services, Saturday, plus all of the friends that we're going to invite. And most importantly, I think, the unbelievers that I know you guys have been inviting and are inviting, right? Let's do this. Just say in your mind right now, I'm going to go find my unbelieving fr family, friends. And it doesn't mean unbelieving like they may even say they're Christians, but they're saying it when they're drinking a bottle of Johnny Walker. All right, bring them, let them hear the gospel, let them see the celebration of Christians, that um, no club in town is going to be as exciting and, uh, you know, we don't need alcohol to have smiles on our faces because we're celebrating our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, this coming Saturday. So um, are you guys coming? Great. Are you sure? Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And in case it's not clear in the announcements, as you turn there, that on January 6th, that Sunday where we're celebrating 12 years as a church, um, we are combining all services. So it's about from 10 to 12 or 10 to 12.30, something like that, we are having one service on that Sunday. Okay? So don't forget that. Many of you probably have not heard the name Charles Templeton. Charles Templeton, many years ago, was a evangelist with the organization that some of you may have heard of, as it's even in Kenya, and a branch in Eldoret today called Youth for Christ. Charles Templeton, it was said about him in uh, an article that he was the most gifted talented preacher in all of America. One of his colleagues you may have heard of, his name is Billy Graham. And that was said of Charles Templeton even before Billy Graham was well known. About five years into Charles Templeton's ministry at Youth for Christ, he abandoned the faith and said he wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Many of us would not even have remembered him or heard of him except for Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for Faith, heard about Charles Templeton, found him, and did an interview where in the interview, Charles Templeton said, Jesus Christ is the greatest man who's ever lived. Everything good I know, decent I know, and pure I know, I've learned from Jesus Christ. And when Charles Templeton said those words, he buried his face in his hands and began to weep. When he was done weeping, he said, I miss him every single day. Even those who deny him. 50 years prior, Charles Templeton said, I want nothing to do with him. Missed him every day he was apart from him. Let me read to you a few things that renowned people has said about Jesus Christ. Albert Einstein says, I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure who is the Nazarene. Napoleon, who has had a resurgence uh, in our minds because of the new movie, which I have not seen, but um, that genius military commander said this about Jesus Christ. He said, I know men and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible comparison. H.G. Wells, the historian who was not a Christian, said, I am a historian. I am not a believer, but I must confess as a historian, 
that this penniless or shillingless preacher from Nazareth is irrevocably the center of all human history. Jesus Christ is easily the most dominant figure in all of history. And the Christian novelist and writer, Fedor Dostoevsky said, I believe there is no one deeper, lovelier, more sympathetic, and more perfect than Jesus Christ. Not only has there never been anyone like him, there never will be anyone like him again. Or ever. So you look at Jesus Christ. Let me mention another. It's been a long time since I've given you this quote. Bear with me, it's very long. But some of us may have heard of Malcolm Muggridge or Muggridge. Malcolm Muggridge was a brilliant journalist who got saved as an adult later in his life. And Malcolm Muggridge, who was very good at, at, at writing, he was, he was brilliant, he said this. We look, he was an Englishman, for context, who lived through World War I and World War II. And he says, we look back upon history and what do we see? Empires rising and empires falling. Wealth accumulated and wealth dispersed. I look back upon my own countrymen who are still convinced of what is a popular song, God who made the mighty will make the mightier yet. Shakespeare has spoke of great ones that ebb and flow with the moon. Um, I look at America, he said, more powerful than the rest of the world combined, and if they so desired, could conquer the known world with their military might and weaponry. He says, I look, I've heard a crazed, cracked Austrian announce to the world the establishment of a Reich that would last a thousand years. I've heard an Italian clown acclaimed by the intellectual elite as a wiser than Solomon. Um, excuse me. Uh, uh, no, an Italian clown say he was going to stop and restart the, uh, the calendar with his own ascension to power. And he says, I've heard a murderous Georgian Brigham acclaimed by the intellectual elite as a wiser than Solomon, a more humane than Marcus Aurelius and a more enlightened than chokers amongst us. And he says this, all in one lifetime and it's all gone, gone with the wind. England, a tiny island off the coast of Europe, threatened with bankruptcy and dismemberment. America threatened with losing its precious fluids that keep the motorways roaring and the smog settling. Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini, forbidden names in the governments they founded. In one lifetime and it's all gone. Gone with the wind. Behind the debris of these solemn supermen and self-styled diplomatists and politicians stands the gigantic figure of one man in whom, by whom, and through whom is the forgiveness of sins, the man Jesus Christ. Amen? There is no question that Jesus Christ, even for unbelievers, is the most dominant personality in all of human history. And the passage of Scripture that I want us to look at today for a moment, because that's all we have, just the blink of an eye, is the theology of Christmas. The incarnation from a heavenly perspective is what Philippians chapter 2, 5 through 11 gives us, not the story of the birth of Christ as Luke chapter 2 gives us. This is the treasure of all of the Apostle Paul's writings. There is no greater portion of scripture describing the humility of Christ than the one I will read to you in a moment. One person also said, you can tell the depth of a well by how much rope you lower. This is an infinite rope that goes well beyond from the earth to the most outer universe and beyond that is continually being lowered 
as we meditate on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. John Stott, the great theologian, said, there is nothing as fantastic in fiction as the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Nobody has imagined a greater story. Recently, I walked in the house where C.S. Lewis lived. I saw where he would write and dip his ink or his pen in the ink to write those wonderful books and beautiful stories about Narnia. And then me and my family and, and uh, Eutychus who's, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, Weenie, we walked out with Mackenzie too. We walked out into the woods where he was inspired to write Narnia. And it was, it was kind of a, it's like there was a fog machine out there. It was kind of this enchanting place. And not even the brilliance of C.S. Lewis could come up with a story as wonderful as this one. And the good news about this incarnation is that it's true. That's the best part of it all. And nobody has created a distance. You know, we watch these or we've heard of these movies that they constantly are producing and writing. Some of them, uh, this Marvel universe that really is pagan. But, but uh, they create these stories where they get in their spaceships and they can fly not only to, to, uh, to, to different universes, but different multiverses within those universes. And still, nobody has created a distance larger than the one being described here in Philippians chapter 2. Let me read it for you. Beginning in verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped, or did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, some translations say. But made of himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. Being found... In appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus Christ, every tongue will confess that he is Lord of those in, in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth and every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father. Amen. That portion of Scripture, said to be actually a hymn in the early, early church, a, a, a hymn that the Apostle Peter would sing. And Paul, after he wrote it, and James and John, that this Scripture was so beautiful so magnificent that they turned it into song. Years ago, I was about eight to ten years ago now, though I had read this many times, God poured out his grace on me to enable a very finite mind to have the Holy Spirit come upon me and help me just get however small of a grasp the beauty of this portion of scripture. I hope you've experienced it. I began to weep. I began to praise God and to worship him. You see the contrast of our own minds, of our own hearts, striving, ambitious, seeking to get on top, to get promoted, not entirely always evil, to make more money. On and on the list goes personal ambition and desires to make sure we maximize the blessings and the physical blessings that we have on earth. And yet there is one who stands out amongst the entire human race and it is the one who came down from heaven. Jesus Christ, his beauty is un unmatched. There is not the collective beauty of all women that can match the beauty of Jesus Christ. I hope you ladies don't mind me saying that. 
It's, he's amazing. He's, it, it's humbling. I had, um, within the last year, an experience where a family f- member of mine Uh, we spent some time together, and I have not been treated so badly <laughs> in probably all the years I've ever done ministry as by this individual person. And yet, in the midst of all of that, I made some mistakes myself. And after reading this portion of Scripture... And after meditating on it, as I often need to, to bring myself to humility, Holy Spirit told me I need to call and apologize to him. (laughs) Have you ever experienced something so insane where somebody can hurt you so deeply by real offenses and that you need to apologize over something that you did wrong that can't even compare to what they've done? Has anybody experienced this? I hope you have. Because it was painful. You know, one of, those, one of those moments where you look at your phone and you're like, okay, I'm going to call. No, I'm not. And you go back to it. It's like, no, the Holy Spirit. No, no, I know. I'm hearing you wrong. You, you don't want me to apologize for something so small. You call and the verbal abuse on the phone. Because he's or she's, I, I don't want to reveal who it is. Um is ready for a fight and they start yelling and gnashing their teeth and you say, listen, I called to say I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? And then all of a sudden you see the hatefulness, you hear the hatefulness disappear with humility. That's what the title of this message would be, Humility Creates Unity. Humility creates unity. The Apostle Paul, as he had to do in every single epistle he wrote, especially to the Corinthian church, but he wrote to all those churches in Galatia, about 10 churches it's estimated. He wrote it to the Ephesians. He wrote it to the Colossians. He wrote it to the Corinthians. He told Timothy. He told Titus. He mentioned it in every epistle. And that is unity. Unity amongst the saints. Unity amongst the believers. That's you and I. And yet, I don't know of one church that doesn't have quarreling and fighting. I don't know of one. Staff at a church that does not have quarreling and fighting. I don't know of one staff at any missions organization that does not have quarreling and fighting. And by the way, I personally not, have not heard of one family that does not have quarreling and fighting. Have you? Does your family ever argue? No? You do, okay. Okay. Because if you said no just now, just get up and leave now. You don't need church. You just can go. Go home. (laughs) Somebody asked me a few months ago, do you and Kelsey ever fight? I said, after 13 years of marriage, we figured out the key to not fighting. No, I'm kidding. I said, yes, we fight all the time. All the time. But you know... We do have the answer. You know when fights end every time? It's when somebody humbles themselves. It's usually me, not Kelsey. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm joking. It's Kelsey. It's Kelsey. And yet we get to see the beauty of Christ. That's why we sing songs about him, not ourselves. This great condescension and incarnation... We'll cover in five major points. I want you to know I did not come up with these in case you find them online or in a Bible commentary. 
But number one, he abandoned a sovereign position. It says in the word, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God did not consider it something to be grasped or did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So as I mentioned in, about Paul writing about unity to the Colossians, to the Corinthians and all of them. Uh, there is no greater portion than giving us the reason for humility than the incarnation. But that is what he's writing to the Philippians. He's saying, if there's any consolation of, in Christ, if there's any comfort, if there's any fellowship with the Spirit, if there's any joy, which by the way, those are rhetorical questions in Philippians 2. He's saying, of course there's consolation. Of course there's love. Of course there's fellowship with God and, and peace with all of this. Do you want to know why there's peace, Paul is saying? Do you want to know why there's joy? Do you want to know why there's comfort and consolation in Christ? It is because of who Christ is. It's because of his mind. It's because of, uh, through his nature, the actions that he has displayed in coming down and if this mind is in us, which was in Christ Jesus, then we will have unity and we will have the glory of God amongst us. And there'll be nothing short of a revival if we manifest the mind of Christ in our life. So let this mind be in you, he says, because there's love, because there's comfort, because there's consolation, because there's joy, because there's peace, Prefer others above yourself. That's what Jesus did. He abandons his sovereign position. Christ, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped. He actually had in his possession the glory of heaven. The worship of all heavenly beings. And he, being the second person of the Godhead, God the Son let go of all of it to come down to earth. You, you look at that in contrast with humanity. We reach up. One writer said... Love that reaches up is adoration. Love that reaches out is affection. But love that reaches down is grace and humility. He reached down. He let go of the glory of heaven. And, and so many of us are compromising by reaching up in selfish ambition to attain worldly pleasures. But the greatest contrast with Christ probably is Satan himself. In Isaiah chapter 14, we get the five I will statements. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And the most scary I will statement of all, I will be like the most high God. You imagine. You're already deceived when you say, I will be the most high. There can only be how many most highs? One. That's kind of how the math works, Satan. Contrast that with some of the I wills of God. Contrast that with the I will of God when he gives promises to Israel, which we need to be reminded as a church, as I mentioned last week, because of the anti-Semitism that Satan is fostering throughout the world. And may I just say it as a footnote, this is a side part of this sermon. This church stands with Israel, not Hamas, as shocking as that might be to you. And the land that Israel is in belongs to Israel because God created it and he said it's theirs. And by the way, a lot more land than they currently occupy. Study the Old Testament. Okay, I'll come back to the sermon. 
Consider some of these I wills of God with his promises to Israel. I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptian. I will take you to be my people. I will be to you a God. This is all in Exodus 6. Just in one chapter. I will bring you into the land which I have promised you. I will give to you a heritage and inheritance. All in Exodus 6. This is God giving, giving, giving. That's what humility is. That's what love is. It's giving, giving, giving. Not like Satan says, I will obtain for myself glory. <clears throat> Look at some of the seven I wills of Jesus. I will make you fishers of men. I will give you rest. I will keep you. I will love you. I will do what uh, you ask in my name. I will come again and see you. I will send you the Holy Spirit. How gracious, how kind. You look at this, contrast. And Jesus, he possesses by his mighty hand the glories of heaven that is rightfully his as God the Son. And he says, I will let it go. I will release it. The, the scriptures say in Philippians 2, he with every single verse that we read. So he abandons the sovereign position. He let go of his glory. He didn't let go of his deity. He didn't let go of his worth. He let go of his privileges of heaven. You'll always know somebody by their privileges. You can't really define if... You can't really notice if somebody has integrity based on their responsibilities. You can't. Because if you pay somebody to accomplish something, they will fulfill their responsibilities because they need money to live. Give somebody privileges and you'll know if they have integrity. See what they use their privileges on. Privileges of free time, not having at work. What do they do with it? Pri privileges of a business vehicle or a company phone. You give somebody a company phone or a company computer nowadays, they're playing solitaire until the boss shows up and they switch it to some report. You know if somebody has... Integrity based on other privileges, not their responsibilities. So he lets go of this. Number two, he accepts the slave's place. So not only does he leave the highest place of heaven, he doesn't leave the highest place of heaven to come to the highest place on earth. He leaves the highest place of heaven, ladies and gentlemen, to come to the lowest place on earth. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped, made of himself of no reputation, and taking the form of a bond slave. If your word says servant, it's an inaccurate translation. There's no Greek word for servant. It is doulos. He becomes a slave on earth. A slave. Years ago, it was in the newspaper here in Eldoret that the government had given 50 billion shillings to accomplish all that they were doing in the new Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. Does anybody remember this? They were going to build many new structures, buy all new equipment, all of these things, and all of a sudden, 20 billion shillings is missing. Can you imagine that happening, Kenyans? There was a few people, 
accused. One of them was the head of Moy Teaching and Referral Hospital. Number one guy. Well, he was fired, but there was no investigation. You know how these things work. It's like, okay, we'll remove you because there's a lot of heat on what's going on, but don't worry, you're never going to see any jail time because there's going to be no real investigation. Your punishment is losing your p position. Well, people were wondering if he did it. I saw him pull up because I knew him in a brand new Mercedes. And the next day or the next week, I forget, he pulled up in a brand new Hummer. You don't see Hummers in Kenya very often, do you? And I wondered, could he have done this? No, I wondered no more. <laughs> but he was fired. He lost his position. But, but this is what humanity does. He didn't give up this high-paying position to take a lower position. He did the math. He thought, I couldn't get paid 20 billion shillings in 10 lifetimes. So I will leave this position to take a higher position and have more money. See, that's what humanity does. And they're willing to rob, cheat, and steal in order to do it. Jesus Christ stands alone as the one who lets go of the riches of heaven to take the poverty of earth and the lowest position of poverty as a slave. This is worse than house help, people. He is a slave. He has no rights. And he keeps getting lower and lower and lower. Number three, he associates with sinful people. So... He abandons a sovereign position, lets go of the glory and riches of heaven, comes low enough to become a slave, and then he is amongst sinful people. Let me do the illustration that my pastor, uh, uh, when I heard it for the first time, it blessed me so much when he was preaching on the incarnation. Where my home church is, <clears throat> it is in the state of Maine. Maine gets extremely cold. You can imagine that it gets as cold as negative 20 Celsius. Has anybody ever been in negative 20 Celsius? Bob? All right. It's cold. So cold that your nose can freeze when you go outside if there's any moisture in it. Don't go out with a cold. It just sticks together. <laughs> well, one particular winter, my pastor, because his septic tank was so close to the surface, his entire septic tank froze solid, which, by the way, has to be really cold because even in very cold conditions, septic has live organisms that are, al that are alive, and because they're alive, they create heat. So it was buried in the ground, and you have live organism uh, breaking down waste, and it still froze solid. That's how cold it was in, in Maine. Well, he needs his septic uh, system to be liquid. Doesn't work. So he took a space heater. He took a big heater... And he propped it up on a rock, and he plugged it in, and he liquefied his solid septic system. You guys following me? Is this a gross illustration? It's okay. And over a couple hours, the septic system fro or, uh, became liquid. And when he went out there to unplug the space heater, when he unplugged it, it moved, and it went whoop, and fell into the septic system. And he thought to himself, because these are expensive heaters, probably 10, 20,000 shillings. And he thought, I'm not going down after that. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. But he thought, what if my wife fell in the septic tank? Would he jump in? If you husbands just said, no, you got problems. You don't love your wives. 
What if my child do, jump, fell into the septic system? Would he jump in? If your child jump, d- uh, fell into the septic system, would you jump in? Guys, I wouldn't even think about how dirty it was. I am going in after my wife and children. Why? Because it's a matter of worth. It's a matter of worth. You can let the heater remain there because it's not worth going in there and living in the septic system. Going in the septic system. And Jesus, he looked at the cross that was before him and he said, I love them. He became a lower life form. The Bible says he became lower than the angels. He was higher than the angels because he loved us. He dove into the refuse septic sewage of this world and became one of those living organisms. He took on flesh and he dwelt among sinful people. Do you know how disgusting this must have been for Jesus Christ who was God in heaven? Which one of you would look in a trash can and you see the maggots? Anybody seen maggots in a trash can? They're disgusting. Has anybody looked at the maggots and said, oh, they're so cute. I love them. I love them. In fact, I love them so much that I'm going to become one of them so that I can die for all of them and they're going to be the ones that kill me, but I love them enough so that they can all be saved. He becomes a lower life form, something that cannot describe the infinite condescension from God to man. Not even man to a maggot can describe how low he came. And he he keeps getting lower and lower and lower. Fourthly, he adopts a selfless posture. So he, he not only leaves heaven and lets go of it, He comes to earth and becomes the lowest person on earth as a slave. And then he associates with sinful people, dirty, filthy refuse of our sin, of the collective sin of the world. Then he dies the lowest death. It is the death of the cross. That's what the Bible says. He says that he became in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross The worst death, Romans were professionals at torturing people and they discovered that crucifixion was the worst torture that they could possibly put a human through. It was so bad that it was Roman law that a Roman citizen could not be put under the death penalty and be crucified. They were killed other ways. That's how bad crucifixion was. And not only that, Jesus Christ's crucifixion is the worst one of them all. He just keeps coming lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. Therefore, fifthly, he ascends the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, the Bible says, and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus Christ, every tongue will confess that he is Lord of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. I remember, when was it, 2019, when um, the, the COVID thing came, and the tyrannical governments of the world, ruled by who, we learned last week? Thank you, Satan decided they would keep strip clubs open but shut down the church. And many Christians bought into it. Many Christians, oh yeah, it's Christian to not meet. Can you think of sudden how ridiculous that is? It's Christian not to meet? It says that we are to... We are to symbol together to stir each other up in love and good works. Therefore, do not forsake the assembling together of believers even so much as you see the day of Christ approaching. So Satan convinces Christians that the loving thing to do is not to meet. When God says the loving thing to do is to meet. I remember that time. I remember 
two police officers came in. We were having a staff meeting right over here. We, were, we had set up some tables. Now, they didn't point guns at us, but they had AK-47s in their hand when they pointed at us and said, don't have church next Sunday. Those two police officers are dead and buried in the back of the church right now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> They're not. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Let me be honest with you. I was afraid. I was intimidated. I had fear come into my mind, into my heart. My biggest struggle in life is not fear, um, though it had become one. What happens when we close? What happens if we stay open, which I know we should? What encouraged me is two portions of scripture. John 18 and this one right here. In John 18, Jesus had been abused all night in an illegal trial. And in that illegal trial, he was being beaten on the face with open fist. The reason why you close your fist to punch somebody, it cuts them because you have sharp knuckles. But if you want to break somebody's face, you hit them with the palm of your hand. Because the Romans were um, uh, professional torturers, they would beat him. The Bible even says with an open hand, they'd slap him. And it's not to sting the face, it's to break the face because they knew, and it was a practice uh, with the Roman soldiers to hit them like this. So even the kings, or excuse me, the high priest soldiers were slapping him. And he's now before Pilate. Broken. No doubt a broken face. Swollen eyes, broken cheekbones, and broken jaw. But he is in absolute control. So much so that Pilate begins to panic. And he mutters the words, he blurts out in a panic because he is standing before the first person who is going to be crucified that is not begging and pleading and blubbering for his life, and that is Jesus Christ. He remains silent before his torturers, Isaiah 53 says. And he says to Jesus, don't you know I have the power to crucify you? Jesus Christ says some of my favorite words in the New Testament and all the Bible, you would have no power except it's been given to you from above. John chapter 3, Jesus Christ says, I come from above. In John chapter 3, John the Baptist says, Jesus Christ comes from above. So in John 18, when he says that to Pilate, he's essentially saying, hey, Pilate, you would have no power except I gave it to you. I'm in control here. I'm in authority. And he freaks him out. He's like, I want nothing to do with this man. I wash my hands clean of him. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, right now, nobody in this room, nobody in this city, nobody in this nation, and nobody on this planet can wash their hands clean of Jesus Christ. If you do not follow him, you are his enemy and you've rejected him, but he's kind enough to want to make you his friend by saving you by his blood. He ascends the Lord of Lords. The Bible says that he is the Lord of heaven, he is the Lord of earth, and it says he is the Lord of hell right here in Philippians 2. That everyone will call him Lord of, in heaven, in earth and under the earth. Satan is going to call him Lord. We're going to witness it, by the way. There are politicians that I cannot wait to see on their knees calling Jesus Christ Lord. I can name some American ones. I can name some Kenyan ones. I can't wait to see Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Mussolini on their knees calling Jesus Lord. And they will. Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Ruto, Kenyatta. And you know who else? I can't wait till I'm on my knees calling him Lord. The difference is you must believe in him now in order to be born again. 
right now. He abandoned a sovereign position. He accepts the slave's place. He associates with sinful people. He adopts a selfless posture and he ascends the Lord of Lords. You know what I hope this does as the worship team comes out? I hope this makes your problems a little smaller. I hope this makes your frustrations smaller. In fact, I hope it destroys them. I hope it makes the unforgiveness that you have, bitterness and resentment, go away. Is there any God like Jesus Christ? There's none. Our Lord is absolutely humble. And brothers and sisters, Paul preaches this to convince them to be in unity at their church. He says, Philippians, prefer others above yourself. That's how your family will be great. That's how your friendships will be strong. That's how your church will be useful, as that if there is a group of people, individual Christians, that say, I will prefer others above myself because of the mind and example of Jesus Christ. That is the glory of the celebration we have this Christmas season. It is the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's so fabulous, isn't he? He's so beautiful. Honestly, it's very convicting for me. I can get upset. My pride welling up, welling up. I start meditating on offenses. I start meditating on those who are mistreating me, abusing me. And I remember the mind of Christ. That's not what he does. He doesn't meditate on how they can be destroyed. He meditates on how they can receive his salvation, his nature, his blessings. Guys, do you understand that every aspect of fruitful living, every aspect of influential ministry as a Christian, which every one of you have a ministry, is humbling yourself and preferring somebody above yourself. If you want to know how to prefer a, a somebody above yourself, there are thousands of ways. This week alone, you go find somebody that it makes you uncomfortable. You go out of your way to tell somebody about the beauty of Jesus Christ, about the gospel about the glory of our Lord. There's nobody like him. You just sit there and you meditate on him and you say, oh my God, you are so worthy of praise. You are so worthy of worship. We love you, Lord. This is the theology of Christmas. This is the story of the birth of Christ from a heavenly view. Because before the foundations of the world, Jesus Christ existed as God the Son. Let's bow our heads in prayer. I want to give that opportunity right now to those who have not believed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you say, yeah, well, I always believed. I'm talking about belief unto salvation. You've repented. You've forsaken your life of sin. If you're here now and you're backslidden or not born again, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, you will be saved. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you right now. Just right where you sit, raise your hand, and I will pray for your salvation. Anybody? Thank you. Keep your hands raised. Anybody else? Yes.
Maybe you're backslidden. You, you saw from scripture today the glory of Jesus Christ. You know he's worthy of worship. You haven't been praising him. You haven't been worshiping him. Raise your hand. We'll pray for you. Those of you who have your hands raised, keep them raised. Lord, I pray for every person here raising their hand. And I pray that your Holy Spirit comes upon them. And I pray, Lord, that whatever it is going on in their life, whether they are backslidden, they're returning to you, whether they're just getting born again now, you know their story and I pray, Lord, that you'd help them. And Lord, help all of us to see your beauty your infinite beauty. Bless these who have their hands raised, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Just keep your hands raised. Raise them up high, please, so we can see. Look at these people who have their hands raised right now, right here, right here. God bless you. You can put your hands down. Listen, if you raise your hand, guys, go to the Connect Station. Sign up if you've not done it before. As a new believer, we want to contact you. We want to give you a gift of a Bible or a book this week. We want to connect with you. You don't have to do the salvation alone. Let's stand as we pray over the offering and sing this song together. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. That you would give us scripture today. That would show us how magnificent you are and how glorious you are. I pray that you would receive this offering as an act of worship as the ushers and deacons come forward. And we uh, praise you with it, Lord, and ask that you would grant wisdom through the administration of these gifts that we may expand your kingdom, Lord, into the hearts and lives of many more people, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.